Good morning to everyone and welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. I am Dr. Laura Leacher and I am here live in Southern Auditorium at Providence St. Vincent. And welcome to all of you who are joining us on Teams Live. This Grand Rounds is a collaboration between Providence St. Vincent and Providence Portland Medical Center. And you can be here with us in the room or watching live virtual or watch a recording of the session. And you can earn CME credit uh, for any of those ways of viewing today's talk. You can always find whether we will be live or only virtual on the invite to Grand Rounds. And that's also where you can find the link to click to get to the video. Another important announcement, uh, we will be taking a summer break after today's talk and we'll resume Grand Rounds on Tuesday, September 12th. Be sure to come back and tune in as it will be the annual Clavin Lectureship sponsored by the Portland Clinic. And we will be hearing from Dr. Doug Pau of the University of Washington giving the talk Medical Myths. I'll be monitoring the Q&A throughout today's talk, so please go ahead and post any comments or any questions that you have, and I'll mostly hold those until the end as time permits. And now to introduce today's speaker. We are joined by Dr. Alex Seitman, who is Technical Director of the Core Laboratory at Providence Regional Labs here in Portland. Dr. Seitman completed his PhD training in Total Synthetic Organic Chemistry at the University of California, San Diego, and then went on to complete fellowship training in clinical chemistry and toxicology in the Department of Pathology, also at University of California, San Diego. Dr. Seitman's research focuses on the development of small molecule quantitation assays using mass spectrometry, and his areas of interest include lab stewardship and laboratory informatics. He is particularly interested in establishing efficient production workflows in toxicology testing to meet the growing testing demands in his laboratory. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Seitman. Thank you for that introduction. Um, just to add a little bit more, I've been with Providence Regional Labs for eight years. I love speaking with residents and, and the faculty, so I appreciate the invitation. So today we'll be talking a lot about different drug testing methodologies and giving kind of a, a large overview and foundational overview of how drug testing works, and then end with some case studies, which I think would be fun. Uh, here are the learning objectives that were in the talk. So it's identify common caveats and differences between urine drug screening and confirmatory assays. Describe best practices for evaluating and interpreting drug testing results and then evaluating drug screening and confirmation strategies that fit into different healthcare settings. I am very boring. I do not have any disclosures to discuss. So we're going to start with part one, which is really a crash course in drug testing. Um, some of this might be overview and some of this might be new information for the group. So I like to think of drug testing methodologies as bucketed into two different groups. We have drug screening by immunoassays and we have drug confirmations by mass spectrometry. And there are two schools of thought as to how they kind of interact with each other. One could argue that they are a battle where one methodology is better than the other and superior, and one could argue that they are a partnership that them working together can actually provide better care for patients. So I'm going to start by describing drug screen by immunoassay first, and the concept I want to kind of hit home is the fact that drug screens are really um, immunoassay based and they're designed um, to interact or the antibodies themselves are designed to interact with a specific drug and really to, to take this home, it's actually the shape of the drug that matters for an antibody to detect. So this simple pictorial representation is basically a, a patient's urine sample. They've got lots of little small molecules in that sample and you can see the little green antibody is going to try to identify the little blue rhombus. That's the drug of interest, but there's lots of other small molecules in there too. So we want to have some sort of binding event to occur that then creates some sort of analytical signal that then can be detected but there's a catch. Drugs of abuse weigh about 300 atomic mass units. Most immunoassays in the clinical laboratory are actually designed to detect proteins like HCG, a pregnancy hormone. Uh, that's a 36,000 AMU molecule, makes it about 100 times larger. These types of molecules, these proteins are much larger and they're just more sensitive and specific to antibodies. So it makes um, antibodies to de that detect drugs more difficult to be able to create that detection. And so I'm showing two different antibodies here in purple. There's the HCG antibody and the methamphetamine antibody. And you kind of have to zoom in a little bit before you can actually see methamphetamine here. 
the the point I'm trying to make with this pictorial representation is that antibodies don't scale down. You can't make an antibody smaller in order for it to detect a, a smaller target. And, and actually, it's just the little points at the end of the antibody that do any of the real detection anyways. And so I've oversimplified this. There's a lot of binding events that are happening with a bunch of your proteins. But functionally, the smaller the target, the more difficult the antibody has at trying to detect it reliably. And so what does that translate to clinically? So drugs of abuse screens are designed to rule out drugs or drug classes, not rule in. So they're designed to have very high sensitivity. You don't want to miss anything in that drug class. You want to capture anything that could be humanly possible looking like that drug. But what that comes at is the expense of what's called specificity. So now, because you're trying to look for anything that could be shaped like that drug, you sometimes end up capturing other things that aren't that drug. So you have higher false positivity rates, generally speaking. And so back to this, um, this pictorial representation, there's lots of little shapes that kind of have little corners that are similarly shaped to that little blue rhombus. So it makes this antibody, it gives this antibody a hard time. And, and that's part of why we see more false positives sometimes with drug screens. So how's mass spec different? How's mass spectrometry different? So mass spectrometry can weigh individual molecules. Simplifying it, I think of it as a really fancy scale. And molecular weight is much more specific than molecular shape. And that's a really important key point to take home. The other thing that mass spectrometry can do is count the number of molecules that it weighs. So it's a very fancy tally keeper. And so now, Using both of those concepts together, mass spectrometry can now identify unique drugs and metabolites within a drug class. So the good example is when your patient's opiate screen is positive, there's lots of opiates that could have caused that positive screen. We have no idea what caused it. It could be codeine that you've prescribed. It could be heroin that was not prescribed, and it could be a combination of both. We don't know until mass spectrometry comes in and identifies both of those separately. And so putting it all together um, in an ideal world, here's a workflow. We've got 49 patients that are screened for a particular drug or drug class. Maybe only five of them are screening positive for that drug class. So now we can be pretty confident that the other 44, we can rule out. We're not concerned about drug exposure for those other 44 patients. And then these five patients go then on to getting confirmed by mass spectrometry. And maybe only two of them confirm positive. So it's a 60% false positive rate. We go, wow, that's a really crummy assay. But when we look at it holistically, the screen was able to rule out a bunch of patients very early on, allowing us to then really focus on the patients that we need to. Mass spectrometry, I'm going to rip the Band-Aid off, is far more expensive and time-consuming than, than drug screening. So combining them together, in my opinion, is a better tool to use for patient care than trying to separate them out. Okay, so moving on. Let's talk about drug metabolism. This is in no way a drug metabolism talk, but I do need to kind of bring in some information about this to talk about how the laboratory designs drug confirmation and screen assays. So this is just an example for hydrocodone. It goes through two different um, uh, pathways of metabolism. There's the CYP2D6 pathway, which O demethylates at the oxygen. And that's a minor pathway and makes hydromorphone, which is active. And then there's also the N demethylation, which removes the methyl group from the nitrogen. Um, and that's through a CYP3A4. These are both CYP enzymes. These are both happening in the liver. The liver is attempting to make both of these molecules more polar. They put them back in the bloodstream. That makes polar molecules easier for the kidneys to filter. So the, the liver and the kidneys are working together to excrete molecules. So all three of these can be detected by mass spectrometry. And all three of these we do detect by mass spectrometry. And the reason for it is this metabolism pattern can help identify patients who are compliant with their medications. Sometimes we only look for the metabolites because the liver and the kidneys are working really well to basically remove all of the parent drug before we would even see it in urine. And sometimes the parent drug is the only thing that we end up seeing in urine and all everything in between. So depending on your specific drug profile, we may be looking for different drugs and drug metabolites in our final confirmatory panels. Okay, so let's talk about cutoffs. And I'm going to start with an easy example first, and then we'll get a little more difficult. So cutoffs are designed to basically tell you whether a patient is positive or detected or negative, not detected. But what does that really mean? So I'm going to look at THC 
In fact, it's a THC metabolite that we use for our, um, our screen. This is at the drug screen level. And effectively what we do is we have what's called a calibrator, which is a urine or a liquid sample that has exactly 20 nanograms per milliliter of THC in it. And we challenge that specific liquid sample to the assay that we're interested in. And then there's a binding event that occurs with those antibodies that have been designed to detect THC, and you get a specific amount of signal that is recorded. That recorded signal now is compared to all of your unknown samples that you are now testing. And if the unknown samples response is lower than that calibrator at 20, it is considered negative or not detected. And if it's greater than, it's considered positive or detected. So that's a simple example. I call it simple because it gets more complicated when you talk about drug classes. So opiates is not a drug. It is a drug class. And so the opiates cut off, everything is very similar. It's the same kind of challenging, except for the calibrator actually just has morphine in it. Okay, 300 nanograms per milliliter of morphine. This is a fairly standard um, cutoff for opiates. And now your response of your unknowns, everything is compared to a basically 300 nanogram per milliliter equivalent of morphine rather than um, rather than a, a, a class of drugs. So now how do how do other opiates respond in this? How does hydrocodone respond and oxycodone and all of your other opiates? Well, that's when we look at package inserts. This is a really tiny screen. I hope you can see that, but I will focus in on a couple things. So package inserts basically are manufacturer instructions on how to use the assay. And so the opiates component of this um, immunoassay screen shows that morphine to 300 has a cross-reactivity. I'm bringing in a new concept, cross-reactivity of 100%. That makes sense. You challenge this assay with morphine at 300 nanograms per mil, and you're going to have a 100% cross-reactivity because that's exactly how the assay is designed. But let's look at oxycodone. I don't know if you can see that number, but it basically says it would take 75,000 nanograms per milliliter or more in a patient sample for it to then hit positive. That's a 0.4% cross reactivity. What that translates to is this is not going to detect oxycodone. And that's why we have a separate oxycodone assay screen altogether, because oxycodone does not cross react with enough with this assay in order for us to use it reliably. Um, but let's look at a middle ground here. Let's look at hydrocodone. So hydrocodone is clearly not as bad as oxycodone, but it's not as good as morphine. Hydrocodone, it would take 1,250 nanograms per milliliter of hydrocodone in order for it to be positive on a drug screen. This is also not looking at hydromorphone, which is right below it at 2,500, and also nor hydrocodone, which isn't even mentioned in this, um, in this package insert. So all the meta metabolites also contribute. This is not the package insert that is used for the screens that you're running right now at St. Vincent's, but this is an example. Our hydrocodone uh, cross-reactivity is much better, but these are things to consider, particularly if your patient is, is negative when you're not expecting that. And, and the best thing to do is, you know, call me, we can talk about it, make, maybe figure out something else that's going on. So I want to talk about um, I, I, in my in my drug consult program here at Providence, I, I get a lot of different questions uh, from clinicians about drug screening and confirmation results. But ultimately, they all kind of connect when the test results are not equating to the clinical picture, and there and there's a concern. So I want to kind of give some overview of some of the most common questions that I get to kind of help with your care of your patients. Um, I'd say 95% of my drug screen consults are based within two kind of main flavors of questions. The first flavor is how long, and you can insert whatever drug you want, will be positive in a patient after last exposure. Another variant of that is my patient claims to have taken a specific drug a specific number of days ago, and now they're either positive or negative. Does that claim make sense? And a lot of this is, is coming from when we have a claim that, that is just really not jiving with, with what reality might be. So a good example might be a patient who has claimed that they haven't used um, or been exposed to cocaine in the last six months, and yet their cocaine screen and confirmation is positive. They're asking me, you know, you know does that claim make sense? Can you be positive for cocaine for six months? Those are kind of the questions that I get. And then the other flavor is what exactly caused a false positive in a specific screen? So this scenario is where you have a patient, um, they're screening positive, typically for something illicit like cocaine metabolite or methamphetamine, something that's concerning, and then they're confirming negative. And so now the patient is concerned or you're concerned about like, you know, what is causing this specific false positive? 
And then the other variant of that is, you know, I'm I'm ordering drug screening and drug specifically drug screening to detect a specific drug, and it's cons consistently negative. I'm confident that my patient is is using this drug, and it's consistently negative. And now I'm questioning whether I'm even using the right screen. So let's talk about each one of these. So the first one's the easiest one. How long will a drug be positive for? Um, well, what I typically say is, you know, first of all, urine is not a very good matrix to really determine any sort of pharmacokinetics, but and, and hydration patterns are quite variable. However, there are some reasonable expectations that are pretty well defined in literature for the amount of time you can expect a drug to be positive in a patient after last exposure with a specific window of time. So back to that um, patient who claims to haven't uh, used cocaine in the last six months, cocaine metabolite looks to be about two to four days. And so if it's confirming positive for cocaine metabolite, that claim just doesn't really make sense. And I can help kind of help explain what these expectations are. And then that can be where you can have the conversation with your patients. This is the hardest one for me to talk about with physicians because unfortunately, most of the time, there's really nothing I can do to figure out what caused the false positive in a specific patient. Most of the time, I always do a medication review to make sure that we're not missing anything that's glaringly obvious or a bit more subtle, but most of the time we come up with nothing. But this is why it's a screen. The screen is designed to detect lots of different things to make sure that we're not missing any um, false negatives, and therefore sometimes we end up with false positives. Uh, this is just my opinion over, over kind of my my career, I, I've some no, noticed some patients just somehow for some reason have these metabolic patterns that are just, or they're exposed to something that's innocuous that's just constantly causing these false positives in a particular screen. So just false positive methamphetamines or just false positive cocaine metabolites, and there's and it confirms negative every single time. And there's really nothing that we can really find that's glaringly obvious. But I'm going to pick on this a little bit more only because there are specific drugs that are being prescribed and other um, supplements that have been shown in literature. I wrote a paper in 2014, which is it's a bit old now, the now these days, but um, that that do show that some drugs that are being prescribed can have cross reactivity with some immuno assays to cause these false positives. So here's methamphetamine again. Uh, DMAA is a supplement in in like power powders. Uh, for like weightlifters sometimes, and, and it has been shown to cause some false positivity in some assays. Trazodone, it's actually not trazodone, it's actually a metabolite of trazodone that shows up in urine that also can have false positives with methamphetamine-based assays. And you can see that there are some similarities with the drug shape. And remember, we said that, you know, these antibodies are detecting drug shapes. That's how they are. They're creating these binding events. And so it kind of makes sense. That the more structurally similar the molecule is, the more likely you're going to get a potential binding event. Picking on it a little bit more, um, these are some neurotransmitters, and I haven't even talked about all the metabolites that would show up in urine, but, but look at dopamine in particular. Look how similar dopamine is structurally, and these are organic chemistry, and I know I'm a nerd, but this, these are very structurally similar to methamphetamine, and this is kind of why methamphetamine is such a powerful drug. It is acting like a neurotransmitter and is hitting the same receptors from a structural basis, so it kind of makes sense that in the reverse, when you're trying to detect methamphetamine only, and you have all these other neurotransmitters and metabolites that are kind of showing up in large concentrations in urine, you may get some cross-reactivity. But again, this is why it's important to confirm all false positives or all presumptive positives, in my opinion. Um, would this drug expect it to be positive? So here's a couple of examples. This happens a lot. A lot of physicians are ordering um, methyl uh, Ritalin. Sorry, they're ordering amphetamine screening with the intent to detect methylphenidate or Ritalin use or um, exposure. And that's highly unlikely. Ritalin is is not an amphetamine itself. It doesn't, it's not shaped like an amphetamine. And so it's it's not gonna be detected. This is an older one uh, that, that used to be concerning about five years ago. And I think there's a lot more movement into understanding that fentanyl is not the same thing as a as an opiate uh, traditionally shaped, but you know, we've we would have people Physicians contact me going, hey, I've got this patient on a fentanyl patch. I see the patch on them, and their their opiate screen is always negative. Why is that? It's like, well, fentanyl is not going to be detected by an opiate screen. But that's why we have a separate fentanyl screen nowadays. This actually was really concerning. Um, about five years ago, we would have 
uh, ED physicians contacting me going, hey, I got a patient with a toxidrome of opiate overdose. We're giving them naloxone. They're kind of waking up and then they're immediately becoming somnolent again within, I don't know, five, 10 minutes. Their screens are always negative. What's going on? I was like, well, this could be fentanyl. Have you have you ordered fentanyl confirmation? They're like, no, because we didn't have fentanyl screens back then. So we've we've moved on from that. But these are kind of the cross-reactivity differences that, that we need to do. So sometimes you're testing for something that will never be uh, positive. And, and if you have questions, you can always call me. I, uh, quick guides are pretty useful for me um, and for my physician groups. This is, I just made this in Excel. It's just talking about all of the different um, drug screen components in the different columns and then kind of describing what the drug screen is supposed to be detecting, what it's not supposed to be detecting, any notes um, that are relevant. There are also are confirmation orders. So if you if you want a copy of this, email me and I can I can give you a copy of it. So I want to quickly talk about specimens suspicious of adulteration. This is more of an outpatient type of concern. This is more for pain management. Um, so and, and, Especially for pain management, there is always concern that the sample is is adulterated in in certain ways. And so, the most common way that specimens are adulterated to mask the use of or exposure of other drugs is to dilute them. Um, so, specimens themselves look like water. They have a very low specific gravity, so near one. The creatinine tends to be very low in the urine specimen or in the specimen itself, less than 20 milligrams per deciliter. Um, and this can be caused by two ways. It's either really severe overhydration, so the patient is drinking lots and lots of water in order to, you know, flush out the um, the drug that they may not want to be detected, or there is an addition of some other fluid after a void. On the flip side, samples can get really, really concentrated, so this could be the addition of like a salt. This is intended to interfere with the immunoassay screen because salts can actually ruin the binding events that are happening. Um, with the antibodies. And so if you see, you know, a specific gravity of 1.03, that's another uh, concerning finding. Um, samples with obvious particulate matter. Now this is an interesting one. So most urine specimens that are collected and observed within 10 minutes of collection have no kind of settling debris in the, in the container. Sometimes if you have a UTI, it might be a bit cloudy, but there really shouldn't be any settling debris. This is very concerning for addition of a powder or a crushed up pill to help ma to mask potential diversion. Temperature, pH, and nitrites are other indicators that are also available. But from a stewardship perspective, in the clinic, um, specific gravity and creatinine, in my opinion, are fairly equivalent in terms of their utility. Um, both of them can pretty rapidly identify very dilute specimens. Uh, temperatures next. You can you can buy ten cent, five cent temperature strips that can that are disposable that can be affixed to different to the cups that are being voided in. You can then validate how what the temperature is right after a void within like five minutes. A lot of clinics are doing this, and if the temperature is too low, that's a concern that the the liquid that is in that container did not come from a human. It came out of a, a cup in, that was hidden in a purse or a pocket. Um, pH and other adulteration tests. You start losing your ability to gain any more kind of visual on what's going on in a patient and it just becomes more expensive. So the simple approach in my opinion is is to just analyze a urine creatinine which is what we do at Providence and and if it's below normal we'll request a recollect. I just want to make this clear that we the the laboratory does not stop testing. So this is more for your information to have a conversation with your patients. I did have conversations with our pain management clinicians about 5 years ago just asking, you know, do you want us to stop and cancel these tests? And the answer was no, 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 no. We don't want that. So this is still a conversation that can happen. But if the P, or if the creatinine is lo less than 20 uh, milligrams per deciliter, that's a concern that the sample is very, very dilute. Okay, so key points to remember before we move on to the second part. Drug screens may indicate what drugs a patient may be on, may be exposed to in the past uh, with general timelines. They also should be able to rule out uh, patients that are negative for drugs. Drug screens cannot, and I'm sorry, they cannot pinpoint which drugs in a drug class are taken. You have to do confirmation testing to know. And then drug testing in general, this is combining uh, screening and confirmations that cannot pinpoint precisely when a patient took a drug. Uh, an hour ago versus a day ago, that's urine is not pharmacokinetic based. I can't do it for you and I'm sorry. 
um, and it cannot determine how much of a drug was taken. This is another one that I want to hit home. I can't tell you whether a patient has been exposed to twice a dose or half a dose. And I, and I do urge caution when looking at previous drug confirmations. If you see a hydrocodone of, you know, 1500 one day, and then, you know, three months later, their hydrocodone is 750. That doesn't necessarily mean that they've done anything nefarious. It's just hydration patterns might be different. Okay, so moving on to part two, this is kind of just I think updates in just general drug testing trends. There are some social trends that I'm going to bring in, but also some some testing trends and as to what is kind of up and coming. So the first thing I want to talk about, and this was actually brought up uh, from the residency group over at PPMC, and it's really asking the question, is THC and opiate co-use dangerous? So I'm going to provide the caveat that I am not a clinical pharmacist, but I, I have been able to pull some data that I think is very telling. And it's it's actually, it's twofold. I think the first part about it is, will a patient who is currently exposed to an opiate and also co-exposed to THC, is that a physically dangerous event for that patient in real time? And I believe the answer based on literature is no. And I think the real reason for that is THC and morphine are binding to different sets of receptors. Where morphine and other opiate-like drugs are binding to a lot of the central nervous system receptors that are causing the toxicities that we're concerned about, like respiratory depression, cannabinoids are not binding to those same receptors. So there is, there's not, no synergism that's happening within those two different drug classes that could potentially cause a more acute overdose. So I don't think it's immediately dangerous for a patient to have a drug confirmation, let's say, that's positive for opiates and for THC at the same time. However, there is a lot of literature out there that is suggestive that using THC over time increases the risk of opiate misuse. So that's more of a social aspect of this, that long term, this is a concern. So, you know, take that as it will. The, um, the CDC and the FDA have both, along with SAMHSA, have both basically recommended that use of marijuana with opiates is not a recommended strategy in really any context. However, that's, that's up to you as a physician to really understand whether that's uh, an important concept to discuss with your patient. Okay, I think everybody has heard about xylazine at this point to some extent, um, and I've gotten a lot of phone calls about this from, from physicians with concerns. So I wanted to give a brief overview of xylazine. Um, it's a non-opioid agent. It's actually approved for veterinary medicine. There, to my knowledge, there is no approval for any use in humans. Um, it's similar to clonidine. So it's a, an alpha-2 androgenic receptor agonist. It does cause a rapid decrease um, in the release of norepinephrine and dopamine and effectively causes sedation. We've seen a massive increase in xylazine exposures uh, in Oregon in particular. And what's more interesting, and this is actually uh, some conversation that we had or with, with Dr. Marshall's talk last week, um, it's being paired with fentanyl. So it's actually, fentanyl is already a cut in counterfeit drugs. So most patients who are, are purchasing counterfeit drugs on the street that they believe are oxycodone or hydrocodone do not believe that they are exposed to fentanyl. So that's already something. Now it's being cut again with xylazine. So many counterfeit drugs that we are finding on the streets are a combination of xylazine and fentanyl. And in fact, 8% of suspected fentanyl exposures have evidence of xylazine in our laboratory right now. Um, it's actually between 5 and 10%. It fluctuates, but it's increasing. So this is actually a, a, an important day. We actually now offer xylazine testing for patients. It's actually going live today in the laboratory. Um, it's an interesting way that we design this. Um, because xylazine is paired with fentanyl almost exclusively, it will be confirmed using our fentanyl confirmation assay. So there are two ways that this can happen. One, if you order any of these three screens and it is positive for fentanyl, you will automatically get a reflex for not only fentanyl confirmation, but also for xylazine confirmation. If you are concerned about xylazine by itself, 
um, whether or not you have ordered screening or whether the screening was negative, you can always order um, direct fentanyl confirmation, which will then also include a xylazine subunit um, component. This is a great example where we were talking about, excuse me, metabolism patterns. What we get in, in the fentanyl assay is fentanyl and norfentanyl. Norfentanyl is the main metabolite, so we're offering two. Xylazine, we're only offering the parent drug. The, the real reason for that is it's, it's excreted about 70% as a parent drug in urine. So there's really no reason for us to look for metabolites. Even though they exist, we, there's no reason to design looking for a bunch of metabolites that don't change the clinical picture. So if, you, if xylazine is present in the urine, it's present in the patient. If we don't see it in the urine, it's not present in the patient. And we're not worried that, that different metabolites are going to provide a different clinical picture. Okay, so I was asked to discuss diversity, equity, and um, inclusion in, in my talk. And toxicology, there's a lot of opportunity to improve some of these outcomes. Um, and what I wanted to bring up uh, first was risk-based drug testing. And I can say that I was included in some of the original conversations, I don't know, five, six years ago, discussing risk-based drug screening and drug testing methodologies uh, in, at Providence. And what we've learned is that sometimes risk-based drug testing um, has racial biases to it. So this paper in JAMA, this is not super new information, but this came out, I believe, in 2019. Um, and it really is showing, and there's many papers that have come out that have corroborated this, have shown that there is an association with race in the amount of urine toxicology testing that is performed, particularly on pregnant patients. This paper all, all was also very telling because not only were black patients um, tested more frequently than white patient counterparts, the number of positivities was no, no different between the two uh, groups. And so that's an important kind of piece of it. So this is more of a provocative statement to say, you know, maybe start considering universal screening in different areas of patient care for different area, uh, for different utilities rather than considering risk-based screening because I think everybody could everybody has implicit bias and there may be ways for us to remove some of these by by providing universal screening rather than these risk-based screening methodologies. And then I want to talk about some inclusive language, and I'm going to call this the Tox Edition. This is actually jumping a lot off of what Dr. Marshall was talking about last week, but I wanted to expand on this a little bit. So I am part of our drug interpretation program. So when a physician contacts me and asks for an interpretation based on medication list and also based on drug screening or drug confirmation results, I am I am using language that I believe is as inclusive as possible. And so the first uh, bullet point in the asterisk is used versus exposed to. And so typically when I am writing up an interpretation, I'll say at the end, you know, if a patient is positive for X number of drugs, I'll say that, you know, this is indicative of an exposure to this drug because exposure to has no implication of intent. I have no idea how that drug got into that patient. And quite frankly, that is not my place and not my scope. And so and this is most important uh, with sensitive patient populations like children. We never ever say the word used. We say the word exposed to because we really have no idea. Sometimes I'll use the word used if I'm confident that the patient's in a compliance program. So they are expected to be using, let's say, oxycodone. I can use that term. And then these others, these are, um, this is actually all supported by NIDA um, in the, um, but these are all different uh, pieces of language that I've seen in, in patient charts when I'm doing chart review. Um, I've seen a lot of, oh, the patients had a, a, a several dirty urines in the last several months. We really would just be saying that they are testing positive. Um, the word habit I see a lot, um, and that really undermines the severity of, of a use disorder. And so many of these, uh, I think, are kind of decreasing in terms of their, their popularity in, in write-ups in the notes that I see, but these are just areas that I wanted to bring up to this group. Okay, last, uh, part three, let's talk about some case studies. So hopefully I can bring in all the concepts that we talked about um, in the last 30 minutes and uh, wrap it up into some case studies. So we've got a patient who's prescribed Norco, it's a fairly standard dose. 
um, screening for the urine sample was completed and was positive for only opiates. And the confirmation showed hydrocodone, norhydrocodone, hydromorphone. So this, those are the scripts. We see that the, the screening was positive for only opiates. And you can see a metabolism pattern that looks fairly consistent with uh, exposure to a drug containing hydrocodone. You can see the norhydrocodone is about the same concentration as hydrocodone, which is pretty common. You can see that the hydromorphone is at a lower concentration. Again, common because of the two different pathways that hydrocodone is metabolized. So this patient, this type of interpretation is really saying, you know, the this looks like a typical pattern of regular use. So this is an easy one. Let's move on. Uh, this patient is currently prescribed Norco twice a day. The screening for the urine sample was completed and was negative for all drugs. <laughs> so we don't have any sort of confirmation reflexive anything when everything is negative. So the physician contacted me and goes, hey, you know, my patient claims to have taken their drug, you know, this morning, but it's negative for everything. The next best thing to do would be to recommend confirmation testing for opiates, just to be sure. And the reason I say that is because we talked about how hydrocodone has a cross-reactivity that's different than opiates, and the opiates is already at 300, which is, is a reasonable level, but is still relatively high. Um, mass spectrometry is at 10. 10 to 20. So it's a much lower cutoff. So we will, we will detect whether this patient is positive for hydrocodone at all. And in fact, it was negative for everything. So in this case, based on the negative screenings and confirmation, this is not consistent with uh, the prescribed medication and the dosing regimen. The patient is likely not compliant with the current medications based on the testing that we've performed. So this one is uh, a patient who was prescribed an amphetamine, dextroamphetamine, 10 milligrams, four times a day. The screening for the urine sample was completed and was positive for amphetamine and MDMA. So now two presumptive screens. Um, and confirmation testing by mass spec, uh, LCMS, MS is mass spec, uh, confirmed only amphetamine is positive. So we see that they have a script for amphetamine. You can see that they are positive for both MDMA and amphetamine. But you can see that although MDMA was tested, it is below our cutoff. So what is going on here? Um, in this case, the positive confirmation for amphetamine is consistent with the prescribed medication. The MDMA is a false positive. So this patient is likely compliant with current medications. But let's talk about this MDMA screen a little bit more. because I think it's important. Um, this is how common we have presumptive positive results. So this is data from our laboratory based on tests that you order. Um, this is about six months worth of data. So you can see there's about 13, This is and this was several years ago, but this is about 13,000 tests every six months that are completed. And this is the percentage positivity. And you can see it here on this uh, graph of those different screens. So you can see that this kind of makes sense. Opiates and THC are the most positive in our patient populations, about 25%. And it goes down very rapidly. You can see the cocaine is about 1%, which is fairly low. Um, this is a population-based thing. This is just interesting as well. Um, cocaine use is more common on the East Coast than the West Coast. We just don't have a lot of cocaine here, and we really never have. So this is a very common tale to have less than 2% positivity rates for cocaine. But let's look at MDMA for a second. This is saying that 12,000 patients were screened for MDMA, which is, was a, a component of our drug screen, and 8% of them were screening positive. That's about a thousand patients, roughly in this time frame, that were screening positive for MDMA, that were then being confirmed by mass spectrometry. Let's move on for a second. Let's talk about false positivity data. What this is basically showing is all the different drug screen components and the the percentage of false positivity. So false positivity is in the pink, and the true positivity is in the the green. So this is basically after a presumptive positive. Once we've confirmed it, if it confirms positive too, it's a true positive. If it, confir if it confirms negative, it's a false positive. And there's a couple of interesting trends that I want to mention here. First of all, oxycodone, methadone, and THC, which are at the top, have very, very low false positivity rates. They are very good drug screens, all less than 5%. And there's a couple reasons for that. And this is kind of going back to some of our foundational concepts that we discussed. Oxycodone, methadone, and THC are all single drug assays, meaning the antibodies are designed to detect that drug and that drug only very, very well. They're not drug classes, so that's number one. 
Oxycodone, methadone, and THC are also very uniquely shaped drugs. There's really nothing like that that the body produces endogenously. You're not producing things that even are kind of sort of shaped like these drugs. And so, again, that adds to the fact that you're not mistaken. These antibodies are not mistakenly detecting something that really isn't there very often. Moving on, benzodiazepines, opiates, barbiturates, and amphetamines, you can see have increased now we're between 10 and almost 40% false positivity. This also makes sense. These are screened as a class. Remember, these antibodies are now having to detect lots of different shapes in a drug class, which means you are opening up the possibility that they're also going to detect shapes that have nothing to do with that drug class at all. Um, amphetamines in particular, Again, I already mentioned are similar to a lot of endogenous neurotransmitters in the body. They're also quite small. And so all of that kind of combines together that you get lots of false positives. But then there's this glaring issue with MDMA. 99.8% of patients were confirming negative for MDMA. So out of 1,000 patients, one was positive truly for MDMA. And so we made the decision as a laboratory with conversations with our pain management groups to remove MDMA as a screen. And I had pushback. I had physicians going, well, what about that one patient that we, we were able to catch? And my counter argument to that is there are thousands and thousands of drugs types that we are not detecting by any assays that are far more prevalent, far more dangerous than MDMA. And this is causing more harm to our patients by screening them positive and then having to have conversations about false positives with them rather than just not screening for them at all. There is a safety net though. We still confirm for MDMA. So you will can, you know, if you ever have concern that your patient is using or is exposed to MDMA, you can always order confirmation testing through amphetamines to get that testing completed. The other thing too is that from a stewardship perspective, um, we ended up switching out MDMA for fentanyl, which I feel like is a far more important screen than having MDMA. Okay, so case number four, a uh, patient is currently prescribed acetaminophen with codeine. It's 30 milligrams of codeine every four to six hours. The other medications noted was Paxil, paroxetine. I'm bringing that up for a reason, hint. Um, the screen for the urine sample was completed and was positive for opiates. And the confirmed positive for codeine, hydrocodone, and norhydrocodone. No morphine was detected. So this is what the data looks like. So we can see the script for codeine. And we can see that the, the sample in question had about 2,300 nanograms per milliliter of codeine. It had a very small amount of hydrocodone and norhydrocodone and no morphine. So there's a couple things that we need to question about this. Codeine's typical metabolism patterns would be through CYP2D6, which would then metabolize to morphine. We see no morphine at all. Um, and we also see a small amount of hydrocodone and norhydrocodone. So we also have to question whether this patient may be exposed to two different drugs. So co-exposure or co-use, where now you have a codeine script and then somehow they're being exposed to hydrocodone as well. So this is a very interesting case. Um, but I really want to bring up the paroxetine. And so this is a huge write-up and it's, it's a lot of words, but I'm going to try to break it down step-by-step uh, step with you. Paroxetine is a very potent CYP2D6 inhibitor. It has basically shut off that entire metabolism pathway through coding to morphine. And so the detection or the absence of morphine is expected. The other thing that's interesting about codeine is there are... There, there, um, there is a low level of metabolism to hydrocodone. So codeine and hydrocodone actually, here's my little arrows going back and forth, they actually will metabolize to each other. So if you have a lot of hydrocodone in a patient, you might see a little bit of codeine. If you have a lot of codeine in a patient, you might see a little bit of hydrocodone. They do cross metabolize to each other. Um, and going back to this, um, this kind of makes sense. Codeine has metabolized slightly to hydrocodone, and this is more pronounced when you have a CYP2D6 inhibitor because, again, your liver, your liver, your liver will push metabolism pathways that are typically not expected more so to eliminate drugs when one of its pathways is shut off. You can also see a small amount of norhydrocodone. Norhydrocodone is a CYP3A4 inhibitor 
um, pathway rather than a CYP2D6. So this also makes sense that you would see a metabolite of, of nor hydrocodone, but you don't see any hydromorphone, which makes sense because hydromorphone, hydrocodone to hydromorphone was the CYP2D6 pathway. I'm not expecting you to all remember this, but if you have questions, concerns about these types of metabolism patterns, you can call me and we can talk about it. So bottom line is, this patient is actually compliant with their medications. Now, something provocative to bring up is the question of whether or not this patient is receiving enough uh, pain relief based off of the CYP2D6 inhibition. Again, I am not a clinical pharmacist. However, I, am, I do have some concerns that this patient may not be receiving the full relief that they may need because they're also being co-prescribed Paxil. Okay, last case study, and then we'll wrap up. Um, this patient is uh, currently prescribed oxycodone 10 milligrams a day, six times a day for pain. Uh, the screening of the urine sample was completed and was positive for only oxycodone. Remember, we have an oxycodone component. It's its own screen. And the confirmation showed oxycodone in extremely high levels with no noroxycodone and no oxymorphone. So this is what it looked like. This was actually greater than 10,000, which means we couldn't even we couldn't even report anything higher than that because that's higher than the mass spectrometer can even report. We did some dilutions on it that we couldn't really report out, but it was roughly around 100,000 nanograms per milliliter with no metabolites. It's very, very strange. Um, my interpretation of this is an extremely high level of oxycodone with undetectable metabolites like noroxycodone and oxymorphone is very atypical. The chances of this being two different CYP enzyme pathways that have been um, blocked are almost impossible. This is more likely a diversion case. Um, to explain diversion a bit more before we go into any more detail, diversion is typically uh, with high-risk patients in pain management. Pain management, uh, these patients are not using their drug. They're not taking their drug as prescribed. Um, and the scenario that I've seen a lot is we will have a patient who will come in and then we'll get a surprise drug screen and they will be negative for everything. Their physician has a conversation with them to come back to provide another drug screen. And then the next day it comes back looking something like this. Diversion is is a um, is a difficult thing to diagnose, um, but again, it's common in patients, and most of the motivation that I have seen in the literature for diversion tactics is based on patients who are not using their drugs but are selling them to someone someone else. Um, and so, we actually have built interpretive comments within the laboratory to detect this. So, if the metabolite ratio of either hydrocodone or oxycodone, depending on what was ordered, meet certain criteria, you will see a flag in your report that will say something along the lines of, and these are both identical except for the, the changes in the drug, uh, the ratio of hydrocodone to norhydrocodone. And we use that ratio in particular because we know it's not as sensitive to uh, metabolite um, CYP2, sorry, CYP uh, inhibition. Um, the ratio of hydrocodone to norhydrocodone is abnormal. It is inconsistent with expected metabolism patterns based on typical medication dosing regimens. Please contact the lab. And the reason for this is I have thousands of, of these confirmations that are coming through a month. I, I can't review every one of them. And so this is helping kind of provide a bit of context to a provider. What this is really doing is helping flag this so that a provider can see this and ask more questions and have conversations with their patients. So with that, I hope that this was telling. I hope that this provided some context to drug screening and drug confirmations, and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Many thanks, Dr. Seitman. Um, such an interesting and relevant talk, and certainly gives me a lot of insights into the work being done at the laboratory in the background to really meet the evolving needs of our patients. So thank you. A um, couple questions online that I'll open up with and then see what we have in the room. Um, first, can you repeat whether we should always be using the fentanyl screen lab um, or whether fentanyl now comes with the standard drug screen? The standard drug screens all contain fentanyl. So let me just, I'll bring this back up. It's still on for the online. Okay. Do, do, do. 
Oops, here we go. So these three screens, um, drug nine panel is the typical a kind of pain management outpatient drug screen panel contains fentanyl as a screening component. So to answer your question, you can get the screening component through the drugs of abuse panel nine, also the drugs of abuse maternity screen. There's also a hospital based drugs of abuse panel as well, but that does not confirm positive or that does not confirm any of the presumptive positives. So this was really in the context of xylazine. So the hospital based drug screen also includes fentanyl so that you're, you, none of the drug screen panels don't contain fentanyl. Hope that answers your question. Absolutely, many thanks. Um, here was an early question in the talk. Um, can we, meaning Providence Laboratories, get the prelim to only be visible internally rather than released to the patient until the confirmatory testing is back? We've had issues with DHS, for example, raising questions after false positives. Absolutely. This is a great question. Um, it's, a, it's a lot to unpack. So right now, Epic does have that capability. We are moving to a new LIS called Beaker. Prelim type uh, review like what you're stating is available. It is a very difficult build and it will require a lot of IT groups or a lot of IT resources. However, I appreciate that being brought up. So if if whoever is in the audience believes that that is an important component, please email me so I can continue this crusade to get this completed, because I also agree. Great, many thanks. Uh, any questions here in the auditorium? Such a great talk, and I already sent you an email asking for the slides. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, cost, can you give me just a sense of the three on the screen? I always worry for my patients who are struggling sometimes to pay for medications that they need. Yeah. And then I'm kind of told I'm supposed to screen, and so I do, but I wonder really how much it costs. Absolutely. So what I can explain to you is effectively what it's called the charge that drops in Epic when this test is ordered. What that means is that's how much the laboratory charges for that test. How that really translates to, you know, after insurance and everything else to the patient, I have no idea. But typical drug screens are between 50 and $75 for a panel. Okay. Each component is about 10 to 15 dollars so this is kind of the 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 side that i can kind of mention too you know for example fentanyl screen urine with reflex reflex to confirmation is a component test you can order every single screen individually it's kind of a painful thing but you can remove specific testing to help lower that overall burden because effectively the drug nine panel has nine components sometimes it doesn't so don't always use the number to actually do this but this time it does have nine components that it would basically be if you ordered only two components, it would be two ninths of the cost. This is another important piece too, just to kind of add to this. Um, THC is included in many of our panels and that's always been a pain point. It's very difficult to also create the same mirror of panels without THC, but the way to work around that would be to be able to, if you don't want THC included as part of your, your typical drug screens or confirmations, you can order all the screens individually. Um, so that answers the screening portion. The confirmation is more difficult depending on the different panel that we're ordering, but again, between 50 and $100 per screen, or sorry, per confirmation. So for example, Let's say you order a drug screen on a patient and they are positive for opiates presumptively and amphetamines presumptively. That's roughly $50 for the screen and then $75, let's say, for opiates and $75 for amphetamines. Combine that together and that's kind of the, the picture that you would see for that particular occurrence. And that, that's another reason why we removed MDMA because there was a cost issue as well. Besides the medical burden of seeing a false positive, it was a financial waste for patients. Great, many thanks. Um, question here: um, In the an example of an unexpected negative screen, can confirmation testing be added on to the same sample that's already at the lab? Yes, so that's a great question. Oops, I'm going too far in the future or in the past. Let's see, let's go back to the cases. So this one, 
is a great example. Case number two. So this patient, and I didn't explain this, so thank you for clar or asking for clarification. So this patient screened negative for everything. Physician called me, was like, hey, I've got some concerns about this. I really need to you know, know what's going on. So I recommended a confirmation testing, and this was added on to this sample. There is a caveat, though. We only keep samples for a limited amount of time. The maximum that we would keep them is seven days. The minimum is three days. So there needs to be, and so there's many times where we have questions about a patient sample and it's already gone. And then there's really nothing I can do about that particular occurrence. But we design all of our confirmation assays to be stable, meaning that we, as long as we have the sample in existence, we can add on the testing. So the, the limiting factor is whether the sample still exists and hasn't been discarded yet. I'll ask one other question here in a somewhat similar vein. Early in the talk, you commented that on screening tests, we might fairly frequently expect false positives, but that false negatives are also um, a rare issue. Any specifics that we should be aware of uh, in interpreting negatives that may be false? Yes, uh, there are a couple. Um, so this uh, quick guide um, is useful for lots of reasons, but the main reason is for benzos. Benzos is kind of the pain point. Uh, lorazepam and clonazepam are not very well detected uh, on any benzodiazepine screen. It doesn't really matter whether you're at Providence, your Legacy, or OHSU. The screens, if they're immunoassay based, this is always a limitation for two different reasons. Lorazepam is just, they're all structurally dissimilar. That's the, that's the fundamental concept of this to why these benzos in particular have difficulty. Clonazepam in particular, it's not necessarily clonazepam. It's the fact that it actually metabolizes heavily to a metabolite called 7-aminoclonazepam, which has effectively zero cross-reactivity with the assays. So this is a very, this is a very common one where you would have a patient who is being prescribed clonopin. They're screening negative multiple to multiple times. The physician calls me, goes, what is going on? And it's like, Ugh, that is one of the caveats. You should order confirmation testing if, if you're concerned. And typically you see a decent level of 7-aminoclonazepam and no clonazepam because, again, that's why we are ordering or that's why we test for the metabolites. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any other ones that are super concerning. The ben Like I said, the benzos have the main ones, you know, the oxazepam triage, so temazepam, oxazepam, diazepam, those are all fine. Alprazolams are fine. It's really when you start getting into the clonazepams, lorazepams, uh, flunitrazepam is another one. Um, if you're concerned about um, uh, uh, sexual assault, we offer that confirmation testing for flunitrazepam in-house, but it's, it's not going to be picked up on the screen itself. Um, let me think if there's any other really concerning false negatives. Um, everybody's concerned about fentanyl analogs. That's just a common thing that we're kind of talking about all the time. Dr. Marshall talked about it before. Some of the fentanyl analogs do get picked up by the screen. This is one of the problems, though. The, the, the hypothetical problems is we are only looking for fentanyl, true fentanyl. So an analog is a different molecular weight, so we will not detect it. So if you get like a false positive fentanyl, that's a concern. But here's the caveat to that caveat. 99%, and this is based in data, of fentanyl analog exposures also are the patient has been exposed to fentanyl as well. So the, the, the counterfeit drugs have fentanyl and alfentanyl or carfentanyl or some other fentanyl in there. So the likelihood that you're going to find a patient who just is positive, for a true positive for a synthetic fentanyl and not have be positive for an actual fentanyl is very, very low, at least right now. Well, thank you, Dr. Seitman. We are coming up uh, right on the top of the hour. Thanks for answering so many questions we had and several I didn't even know that I should have. Um, so thank you. And a reminder to our audience that we are now starting summer break and we'll resume Grand Rounds September 12th. Look forward to seeing you in the fall.